Hi, and welcome to another episode of McClutchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClutchy, and today we're going to be talking about compound interest. This is primarily for students from grade 10 and above. If you have any questions, you can contact me at mcclutchymaths at yahoo.com. So firstly, let's take a brief recap on what compound interest is. The word compound is often used in science to describe multiple parts of some sort of substance. For example, when multiple elements are joined together. It's a little bit different in the finance world. In finance, we're referring to investment and saving and borrowing, and it means building upon that. Essentially, it's earning or paying interest upon interest. It's all about exponential growth. Our formula is taken from the QCAA formula sheet. A equals P brackets I plus I to the power of N, and that power indicates to us that it's exponential. There are different parts to this formula. The first part is A, that is our amount at the end of the investment or the loan. Our P stands for the principal, it's not the person who runs the school, it's the amount at the beginning of the investment or loan. The little i represents the interest rate expressed as a decimal. So if you're given it as a percentage, you need to divide that by 100 before you substitute it into the formula. And this is taken per compounding period. Now I'll explain that a little bit more shortly. Our power of n refers to the number of compounding periods that there are. So you may be asking, what is a compounding period? Well, typically with most compound interest problems that you'll encounter, particularly in grade 10, the compounding period is usually once a year. However, compounding can take place semi-annually, which means twice a year, quarterly, which is four times a year, monthly, weekly, fortnightly, daily, etc. If our problem is done as a yearly compounding problem, that means we have one compounding problem per year. For semi-annually, it means we have two compounding periods per year. For quarterly, it's four compounding periods per year, and so on, depending on our type of compounding. So our formula for compound interest, if you remember I said that I was the interest rate per compounding period. Well, the way that we calculate that is to take our rate as a whole number, so let's say it was 4%, that would be 4, divide that by 100 to convert it to a decimal, and then multiply that denominator by the number of compounding periods per year. So here's an example, 10% per annum compounded monthly. What that I would look like would be 10 divided by 100, that's 0.1, the interest rate as a decimal, but that 0.1 is multiplied by 12 on the denominator. It's very important it's not multiplied on the numerator but on the denominator. The power of n is equal to the number of years multiplied by the number of compounding periods that there are per year and that gives us our total number of compounding periods. For example, if we were compounding weekly for two years, then n would be equal to two years multiplied by 52 weeks which would be 104 compounding periods altogether. There is an alternative formula that you could use for compound interest. Now, you'd have to memorize this one because it's not given on the QCAA's formula sheet. The formula that I've modified, I've taken this from a textbook, and instead of having I by itself, we've now got I divided by K, and instead of the power of N, we've got a power of KT. Let me unpack for you what that means. K, um, K is our number of compounding periods per year. You can see that's on the, on the denominator underneath I, and it's also our, in our power. And T is our number of years. So in our power, we've got that compounding period per year multiplied by the number of years. Okay, let's look at some worked examples. In our first example, I'm gonna do something fairly simple. We've got $1,000 being invested by Josiah for five years. It's compounded at 2.5% per annum. That means we've only got one compounding period. So we can just use the QCAA's formula exactly as it is. So our first step is always write the formula. Second step is always substitute the variables from the question into the formula. We know that Josiah's invested $1,000, that's our principal. The interest rate was 2.5%, and if I convert that to a decimal by dividing it by 100, I end up with 0.025. And N is the number of compounding periods. Well, it's compounded once a year, and it's for five years, so N is equal to five. Now I simply substitute that into the formula. I'm going to have A equals 1,000 multiplied by 1 plus 0 0.025 raised to the power of 5. 
Now, my next step is to evaluate what I can on a calculator, but it's very important that I don't just chuck it all on the calculator and press the equals button and write that down. I do need to show some steps of working for my teacher. So the first step of working I've done is to add 1 to 0.025 and raise that to the power of 5. And then I'm going to multiply that by 1,000 in the last step. I've also given my answer in dollars and cents. Now remember, if your calculator gives you an answer, for example, 100.4, well, that means $100.40. Money always has two decimal places and a dollar sign at the beginning. So make sure you're expressing and communicating that in the correct way. My very final step is to check my answer, make sure it makes sense, and write a statement. Now, how would I know that this makes sense? Well, 2.5% is a fairly small percentage. So over five years, I wouldn't be expecting $1,000 to become a ridiculously large number. So $1,131 at the end of, two, um, of five years seems very reasonable. That's a good way to check. Another good way to check is to just go back over your calculations one more time on your calculator. And then, of course, writing a statement at the end that's usually worth half a mark. Let's look at a more complex example, something with compounding periods throughout the year. Worked example two, Alyssa invests $2,500 for three years, compounded monthly at 4% per annum. How much interest will she earn? Well, my very first step again is to write the formula. I could use the QCAA's formula and then make some changes to I and some changes to N and show those calculations. But I'm going to show you using K and T today. So first I'm going to write the modified formula. I'm going to state my variables. The principal is $2,500. I is equal to 0 0.04. That's the 4% divided by 100 to calculate a decimal. K is the number of compounding periods in one year. Well, there's 12 months in a year. It's compounded monthly. So K is 12. And T is the number of years, which is 3. Now, I simply substitute this into my formula. My next step is to use my calculator to simplify this a little bit further. You will note that I've taken what's in brackets and I've also changed my power from 12 times 3 to 36. So I'm taking it step by step and showing my teacher what I'm doing as I go. The next step would be to evaluate the decimal number and the power on the right hand side and then to make a statement that A is equal to $2,818.15. Notice I've now put the currency back on. However, I'm not quite finished. I found the amount at the end, but the question asks me to find how much interest she earns. Now, if you remember, the formula for interest is um, A equals P plus I. That gives me the amount at the end is equal to the principal plus whatever interest is earned. So I can substitute in what I know, which is A and P. $2,818.15 equals $2,500 plus I, which is our unknown. If I rearrange the formula, I'm going to find that I is equal to $318.15. And of course, my final step is to write a statement and to check my work. Well, once again, $318 seems fairly reasonable. I've checked that I've got a dollar sign. I've got two decimal places. I could also go back over some of those complex calculations using my calculator and make sure I haven't rounded too early, for example. Let's look at another example where we're finding a different variable. In worked example three, we have Dante who has spent $500 on a credit card and he did not pay it off for two whole years. The balance on the credit card was compounded daily, as most credit cards are, and after two years, he owed $1,000. Wow, I'm glad I don't have Dante's debt. So what was the interest rate? Well, firstly, I'm going to write the formula. And once again, because I've got compounding throughout the year, I'm going to use the modified formula. Second step, I'm going to state my variables. A is equal to 1,000, P is 500, K is 365, that's the number of compounding periods in one year, and the number of years is 2, T is 2. So now I'm going to substitute this into my formula. Notice I'm looking for I, and I is still stated as a single variable on its own. What I've done is, in my next step, start to evaluate this on a calculator. I'm going to simplify, firstly, my power. 365 times 2 is equal to 730. Now I'm going to divide both sides by the principal, 500, and I'm left with 2 on the left-hand side and 1 plus i over 365 on the right-hand side raised to the power of 730. My next step is to take the 730th root on my calculator of both sides, which means 2 to the root of 730. It gives me 1.00095 equals 1 plus i over 365. 
Now, you might be tempted to multiply both sides by 365, but you can't do that yet. Firstly, you've got to subtract 1 from both sides, and then you can multiply both sides by 365. That leaves me with i is equal to 0 0.34 and all the other digits. Now, remember, the interest rate should be a percentage, so I need to multiply that by 100 to get the interest rate. I'm going to check and write a statement. Dante is paying 34.64% interest on his credit card. Now, that seems a little bit excessive. However, interest rates used to be that high once upon a time, not so much these days. But that's fairly typical for a, probably a credit card in the 1980s. Wouldn't be borrowing that kind of money. Okay, you might be asking, what happens if you have to find the variable time? Time is one of our powers. Well, time is the exponential in the compound interest formula, and logarithms are a mathematical technique that we could use to find an unknown exponent. But we only do this in math methods and prep math methods. So if you're doing general, then the only method you can really use is guess and check. Now, what I would suggest for doing this is you evaluate as much as you can down to the part where you have to find the power, and then you're simply going to put some suggestions on your paper for your teacher and try and narrow it down as close as you can to a value for time. Now, I'm going to be looking very briefly now at geometric sequences. This is the beyond the scope of what you're interested in. Thank you so much for listening and please do like and subscribe. But if you are doing Year 11 General Maths or Year 12 general um, Math Methods and you want to know a bit more about how compound interest applies to geometric sequences, stay listening. So here's a brief recap about what we know for geometric sequences. Firstly, it's once again for exponential growth and decay. Secondly, we know it's a geometric sequence if it's increasing or decreasing by a percentage. If you see that it's decreasing or increasing by a whole amount, a fixed figure, well then that's got to be an arithmetic sequence and this information will not apply. We have a common ratio. This is an amount, a fraction, that is uh, multiplied by our first term and it continues in a series being multiplied by that first term. It could be a fraction or a whole number. And our formula from the QCAA's formula sheet for geometric sequences is the nth term is equal to the first term multiplied by the common ratio raised to the power of n minus 1. Okay, so what does that mean in relation to compound interest? Well, I've put the two to compare to one another. So our nth term is our amount at the end. Our first term is our principal. And it's multiplied by an amount of interest raised to a power. Now you'll notice that n minus 1 is a little bit different to the power of n. And I'll show you why that is. If we were to write a recurrence relation for compound interest, you would notice that the n plus 1th term is equal to the ratio times by the nth term a. We've got to remember that our principle is actually not a1, it's a0 because our principle is at the very beginning and it's not multiplied by a common ratio at that stage, it's just the starting amount. The next amount, the amount at the end of the first year, a1, is our interest rate times the principle. In other words, if n plus 1 equals n, then n is going to be equal to 0, and that's why a0 is the principle. So that's the little common nuance that you need to be aware of when you're doing compound interest and relating that back to geometric sequences and recurrence relations. I suggest you pause the video if you're a little bit confused, go back to the previous slide, looks a little bit like this, and have a look and see for yourself how that geometric sequence formula changes when it becomes a recurrence relation. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for listening. Once again, I'm Natalie McClutchy. You've been watching McClutchy Maths. Have a great day.